Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 115. I am just back from the Midwest Family History Expo that was held just outside of Kansas City in Overland Park, Kansas, where I gave the keynote address and taught four classes to a very enthusiastic crowd. And uh, thank goodness that we were inside because it was about 105 degrees outside as they were having a record heat wave just as we got there. But we stayed nice and cool. And we worked on cool stuff like uh, Google Earth for genealogy research, identifying old photos, and I taught the creating awesome interactive family history tours with Google Earth, which is always a blast. Everybody gets so excited and they start rattling off ideas and stories that they want to tell in their family history tours, which is really cool to hear. So they were all chomping at the bit to get home and get to work on those. And I love going out to conferences because I get to meet up with listeners. I ran into the first one just before the conference even started. I was uh, in line waiting for a table uh, to take part in some real Kansas City barbecue when premium member Janice walked up and she said, I know you, you are Lisa Louise Cook. (laughs) Well, Janice attended the conference and Boy, oh boy, she was like an amazing walking billboard for Genealogy Gems. She was talking it up and sending folks over to our booth all weekend long. So thank you, thank you very much, Janice. So nice to meet you. And longtime listener Jenna was there, and she wrote up a really nice blog post on her Desperately Seeking Surnames blog. Um, She gives her take on the Midwest Family History Expo and gives me and Genealogy Gems a really nice shout out. So you can read all about it on DesperatelySeekingSurnames.blogspot.com. And the post is called Musings on Monday, Midwest Family History Expo, and it was posted on August 1st of 2011. Of course, I'll have a link for you in the show notes that'll take you directly to the article. And Jenna was busy on Twitter while she was at the conference as well. Um, Here, she tweeted, best quote of hashtag FH Expo, Lisa Louise Cook, I simultaneously admire her and hate her. I want her life. LOL. (laughs) And she says, me too. (laughs) That's a riot. Um, I guess someone out there thought it would be fun to do what I do for a living. Well, it is fun, and I count myself as very, very lucky to be doing it. So um, I guess I'll take that tweet as a compliment, don't you think? But as always, it is very nice to be home, and I'm excited to finally be getting this episode out to you. I've got lots of gems lined up for you, including an interview I conducted while I was at the conference. This is a subject that I have been wanting to cover for quite some time. If you're like me, then chances are at some point as you've been climbing your family tree, you have toyed with the idea of making the trip yourself back to your ancestors' homeland. But that can kind of be a daunting task. And, you know, if you don't know the language or you really just don't know where to start to make the connections that you need to really have a memorable trip. Well, Kathy Wirth has been putting ancestral trips together for many years now, and she's going to be here to give you the -the behind-the-scenes look at what's involved in making that trip back to your ancestral homeland and tips based on her experiences. She's got a wealth of information, so that is coming up a little bit later in the show. But um, first, I have some quick gems here for you. First of all, I want to let you know that if you missed the early bird registration pricing for the upcoming Family Tree University virtual conference, don't worry, (laughs) because Genealogy Gems listeners are going to get 20% off with a very special coupon code that we've just gotten from Family Tree University. Um, This conference is really the first of its kind that I know of. No matter where you live, you can take part in the virtual conference. You can attend every class if you want to. None of that, you know, oh my gosh, there's six classes this hour. Which one am I going to take? That sometimes is our our, um, lucky problem at live conferences. 
In this case, you could attend all of them if you want to, and all from the comfort of your own home. Um, it's going to be a really exciting weekend. It's going to be from Friday, August 19th to Sunday, August 21st of 2011. You're going to get three full days of unlimited access to watch the 15 pre-recorded video classes and participate in live chats. And of course, the big advantage to the fact that these are all pre-recorded is that you do it at your convenience any time of day or night. You can put it on pause and answer the phone, whatever you got to do. But it's really just like podcasts. It's at your convenience. And I'm very excited because I'm going to be debuting my brand new common surname search strategies class. Lots of you guys have been asking for this and I have finally gotten this thing put together. I'm, going to, I'm also going to be hosting a chat on Sunday. Um, and you're going to also hear from nationally known instructors like the photo detective, Maureen Taylor, um, Lisa Alzo, who writes for Family Tree Magazine all the time, Jim Beidler, and many, many more. So, okay, here's the special coupon code that we have just for Genealogy Gems listeners. It's GEMSFTU. So G-E-M-S-F-T-U. That'll still get you 20% off the registration fee for Family Tree University's virtual conference. And in fact, you can use that coupon code for anything that you buy at Family Tree University. So if they have the classes that are going on an ongoing basis. I'm regularly teaching classes, you know, individually as well. And uh, again, GEMS FTU will get you 20% off any of those at any time. So whenever it's convenient for you. But I really encourage you to take a good look at the virtual conference. I just think it's going to be fantastic. Um, I've had several people email me all bummed out because they missed the early bird registration discount. So it's really nice that we're going to be able to have this and you can get that discount uh, even now just before the conference takes place. So the website is familytreeuniversity.com. And again, that coupon code is GEMSFTU. That gets you 20% off. Okay, and I've got a couple of other newsworthy gems <laughs> for you. Um, this week, the Library of Congress updated the Chronicling America website. It's going to include newspapers from three new states added to the program in 2010 and additional coverage for 1836 to 1859. New Mexico, Tennessee, and Vermont are now included with 22 other states and the District of Columbia in Chronicling America's almost 4 million historic newspaper pages published between, again, 1836 all the way through 1922. So you can start searching over at chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. Check out those three new states and all those new pages that are out there. Also, I just got word that the Swedish Genealogical Society of Colorado is going to host the Swede Gen Tour 2011 on September 17th of 2011. It runs from 8.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon. It's going to be at the Community College of Aurora in Aurora, Colorado. If you're going to be in the area, this is a great chance to discover how to find your Swedish roots. The Swede Gen Tour 2011 is going to feature presentations and demonstrations by Swedish family history experts from Sweden, detailing the use of the many resources for Swedish genealogical and historical research. You're going to see demonstrations of Swedish genealogical online sites and databases, as well as Swedish genealogical emigration CDs. There's also going to be some unique opportunities for individual research assistants through the one-on-one -on -one sessions. So um, you can register over at the SGSC website, and I will have that link for you in the show notes. And speaking of Swedish research, Yvonne Hendrickson has been a longtime listener of the show, and she is an expert in Swedish research. She's put together kind of a, a Swedish research guide, and it's a, in a PDF form. So those of you who have the Genealogy Gems podcast app, check out the bonus content. We're going to have that PDF document for you on Swedish research, thanks to Yvonne Hendrickson. And I'll have a link to her site in the show notes. And um, check that out. If you are doing Swedish research, again, this is a great resource. 
Ancestry.ca, the Canadian Ancestry, has partnered with the UK's National Archives to launch the railway employment records. These range from 1833 all the way up through 1963. It's an online collection containing the employment-related records of British railway workers dating back to the invention of the locomotive in the early 19th century. The collection consists of 1.9 million records and goes into intricate detail, listing not only the name, home station, and the date of birth of the employee, but also information on their career progression, salary increases, rewards they got, fines or suspensions for misbehavior, and notes from superiors on the worker's character and behavior. You could learn an awful lot if one of your ancestors happened to have worked for the railway. Um, The records date back from 1833, And by the middle of the 20th century, the entire rail network encompassed 6,000 stations and included more than 21,000 miles of track, with its development widely hailed as the primary catalyst for Britain's industrial growth, according to Ancestry.ca. And according to their press release, the rail networks were brought under government control for the first time during the First World War but were returned to private ownership immediately afterwards when the bulk of the system was in the hands of the so-called Big Four, the Great Western Railway, the London Midland, Scottish Railway, the London and Northeastern Railway, and the Southern Railway, all of whom have thousands of former employees that are listed in this collection. During the Second World War, the companies had to kind of join together to operate as one as the war effort put a really severe strain on the railway's resources and created a substantial maintenance backlog. Part of the reason why the government brought the rail service into the public sector in 1945, in fact, the majority of employment records in this collection date around this period, about 1947, although a number do date up to 1963. So you can check out that new collection at Ancestry.ca, and I'll have a link for you in the show notes. And over at Family Search, they continue their ongoing digitization of records, and they recently announced that they have digitized historic records from eight countries and added them to FamilySearch.org. In addition to 1.8 million new U.S. records, collections from seven other countries were added, including Canada, the Czech Republic, France, Italy, Mexico, the Philippines, and Poland. There are lots of gems for curious minds there, such as the updates to the South Dakota 1945 state census. Love those state censuses. The New York court records, Indiana marriage records, or how about the service affidavits of uh, folks from Utah who served in the militia during the Indian Wars from 1909 to 1917. You can start searching all of those records for free at FamilySearch.org. And even in these tough economic times, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the NEH, just announced on July 27th of 2011, awards totaling $3.8 million to 13 institutions that represent their states in the National Digital Newspaper Program. So this means that there's going to be new digitized historic newspapers coming to the free Chronicling America section of the Library of Congress website. That's going to happen about mid-2012. So lots of money coming down the pike, and uh, hopefully that means lots of new records. Three of these institutions that they're talking about, the Indiana State Library, the State Historical Society of North Dakota, and the West Virginia University Research Corporation are new to the program this year. So this is the first time they're going to have records from them. There are now a total of 28 states that have institutions participating in the National Digital Newspaper Program. Ten other institutions have received ongoing awards to contribute more content to the program. The funding supports the selection of digitization of historic American newspapers published between 1836 and 1922, by each participating state, and they're going to be available online for free. So you can search free records at chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. Those are newspaper records. And 
Next up, I've got from Tina Lyons. She's the vice president of the Indiana Genealogical Society and a Genealogy Gems listener. She says, I thought you and your listeners would like to know about a way to quadruple their donations to the Federation of Genealogical Societies Preserve the Pensions campaign. FGS is raising money to digitize the War of 1812 pension files. So far, over 18,000 images are now available for free at footnote.com. The Indiana Genealogical Society is matching donations up to $10,000 that come through their site until August 31st of 2011. And then Ancestry.com recently announced that they will also match all donations. This includes individual donations and the matching IGS donation. So if you donate $5 to the pension project through IGS, your donation becomes $20. And if you donate $25, your donation becomes 100 Currently, IGS has raised over, uh, I think, about $8,000 from individuals and societies with the IGS and Ancestry donation matches. Over $26,000 has been raised for the Preserve the Pensions Fund. So IGS is going to be presenting a check of all the donations to FGS at the FGS conference in Springfield, Illinois, coming up in September. And you can find out more about the IGS $10,000 match challenge at IND for Indiana, GenSoc.org slash projects, and then look for the 1812 pensions. Thanks for a wonderful podcast, Tina says, and all your genealogy gems. And, uh, of course, I encourage you to go check out Tina's genealogy blog that she writes herself. It's genwishlist.blogspot.com. Now, as you know, video is growing by leaps and bounds online. And, of course, here at Genealogy Gems, I have the Genealogy Gems channel at YouTube. It's packed with over 50 family history-related videos. You can watch those all for free. Some are tutorials. Some are fun. Some are inspirational. It is just so fun to see new genealogy content coming online every day. And Nick Barrett and Laura Perry of Your Family History Magazine out of the UK at your-familyhistory.com have joined in on the fun. They have created a new YouTube video channel called, appropriately enough, Family History Show. Dr. Nick Barrett is a professional genealogist. He's well known uh, and probably best known for his role as genealogist consultant for the series one through four of the BBC show, Who Do You Think You Are? Barrett's also the CEO of Sticks Research Agency. Now, so far, um, I was checking out the channel. It looks like they've got about four videos posted, and my guess is there's going to be more to come. So you can check those out at youtube.com slash family history show. Okay, well, that's the news. That's what's new out there. A couple of gems for you, and we've got more coming up, but those are going to be in response to your messages and emails to me, and we'll do that in the mailbox. This time around the mailbox, we have a flurry of Roots Magic questions. So I went right to the source, Bruce Busby, founder of Roots Magic, and he's got the answers for us. So let's tackle these one by one. Um, Our first one here comes from Brandt, who writes, I recently became aware of a collection of land records, some real estate contracts, deeds, warranty deeds for land that my great grandparents owned in Washington state. The deeds are full of information but I'm not sure how to include them in my database. I use Roots Magic 4, and I've gone through some of the source templates, but as I didn't obtain the original records myself, because they're in the possession of my great uncle, I don't know exactly where they came from, so I'm not sure how to cite them. Also, would I create a land fact in the entry from my great-grandfather and then just describe the land in it? Thanks again for your terrific podcast. I just listened to the Family Tree Magazine podcast, and I'm excited to start using the tips shared in those episodes as well. Well, Brant, um, first, thanks for writing. Thanks for checking out the Family Tree Magazine podcast. You can uh, listen to that. If you haven't already, it's at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And of course, you can just go into iTunes and search Family Tree Magazine, as Brant probably did to find that. Uh, We publish that once a month, and it's kind of a great behind the scenes of the magazine. And Brant, I checked in with Bruce Busby. He recommends adding a property fact type 
which is one of the fact types built into Roots Magic and which is officially supported in GEDCOM. You can use the date field to show the time period that the land was owned. So that could be from 1830 to 1876, something like that. And then you could use the note to enter any description of the land. Then he recommends using the various documents as sources for that fact type. So when you are adding a new source to Roots Magic, you can type land into the search for source type field on the select source type screen to filter the list of source types down to one that's just relating to land records. Next up, Kai has a question about image and source citations. Kai says, First and foremost, a big thank you for the podcast. I have a tendency to ditch podcasts after one to two episodes because the voices of the presenters end up getting on my nerves to the point that I just can't listen to them anymore. <laughs> Not so with yours. Oh, that's good news. Thank you. The enthusiasm and down to earthiness that you have in your podcast makes it a pleasure to listen to. And it's one of the few podcasts that I've listened to for longer than a few months. Ah, I take that as a big compliment. Thank you, Kai. This is my main question is about trees set up in Roots Magic. When I started investigating my tree, I spent a lot of time deciding on a program that I could use for the long haul, and I finally decided on Roots Magic. I've always attached source media to events slash facts, not being aware that it could be attached directly to sources until recently. And now I'm wondering whether there's any point in going through and removing every media item from the individual events slash facts and instead attaching it to the relevant source. Since sharing events between people is so easy, I haven't seen much of a point in doing it before now. Well, Kai, um, Bruce told me that there probably really isn't a compelling reason right now to move existing images from events to sources or citations. Um, there might be in the future, but then they're going to make a big effort to make sure that that's really easy to do. So don't worry about that right now. And Kai's second question is, I'm wondering whether you record your negative research, that is, searched particular source, nothing found, within Roots Magic. I've never bothered with recording negative research before now, but I'm about to start looking through unindexed images on FamilySearch, and since I foresee that taking so much time, I really don't want to look through the same items later on. Can't blame me on that. I was considering creating a new negative research fact and just listing the date, resource, and what I searched for in the notes, sharing that fact with any other people who I looked for. This doesn't seem like an ideal way of doing things. So again, your opinion would be appreciated. Well, I checked with Bruce on this as well. He says that Roots Magic allows you to add facts of any type, birth, marriage, death, etc., and set the proof for that fact to disputed or proven false. Um, it then draws that fact on the screen with a red line through it. So that might take care of it. And uh, I do track my negative research facts, if you're asking about me personally, um, because that's as important as what you find to be proven. And like you say, so that you don't end up redoing and covering the same territory twice. Um, secondly, when entering a source citation, you can enter the quality, which follows the BCG standard and allows you to set the evidence to negative. However, that doesn't mean that the source is wrong. It just means that the source didn't contain the information that you expected to find in it. So great questions. I hope that you find that uh, helpful. And finally, Kate wrote in asking for help with migrating from Family Tree Maker to Roots Magic. But then she got right back to me and she said she found the answer herself right on the Roots Magic website. She writes, on Roots Magic's website, there is a real help with migrating from Family Tree Maker to Roots Magic. I've not gone through this yet, but it looks really promising. And then she attached the PDF that she downloaded um, that she says is a, is a real help. Wanted to pass on this information. Keep up the good work, Kate. So if you are looking to migrate from Family Tree Maker to Roots Magic, Kate points out that there's a great support document on the Roots Magic website that you can download and you can follow along. Um, so I'll have a link directly to that document in the show notes. And you know, support is really one of the key benefits of choosing Roots Magic. Um, I've mentioned in previous episodes that I did a couple of free webinars for Roots Magic on Google for genealogy, which you can find at rootsmagic.com slash webinars. 
but those were just one of many free recorded webinars available on their website. And the bulk of those webinars are really Roots Magic tutorials on just about any question or topic that you can imagine. And there's Bruce Busby himself, the guy who wrote the program, teaching you and answering your questions. You know, Bruce and Mike and all the folks at Roots Magic, um, more than anything, they really want you to be successful in your research and successful in using Roots Magic. And that's just another reason why I am so proud that they are a sponsor of this podcast, because that's really my philosophy, too. This is all about, I want you to find those genealogy gems. I want you to have the information that you need to find them. And um, that's what the podcast is about. And I want to thank Roots Magic so much for sponsoring us and making it possible to keep bringing this free show to you. Um, Next up, a little gem here that kind of came out of an email that I got from Joan, who wrote, I get to spend a day at the National Archives. What should I do to prepare to take full advantage of the visit? I checked their website, but it was not as helpful as I'd hoped. Any suggestions? Well, we all love making the trip, right? And it sounds great. Good thing that you're playing ahead of time. So I've got a couple resources for you here. Now, first of all, this first resource is from the National Archives in the UK, um, but there's still a lot of great suggestions provided from their video series called The Quick Animated Guide. And, and this would work for preparing for any visit to an archives. Go to nationalarchives.gov, click records, and then scroll down and you'll find quick animated guides. And I'll have a link for you that takes you directly to the page for the guides in the show notes. Um, but that's a, a great quick way to kind of watch and get some ideas on how to prepare for a visit to an archives. Another good approach is to do a file type search. This is a little gem for you. It's in Google. And you can do that to see if there are any presentations out there about doing research at the National Archives. So for example, I went to google.com and I did a search on like National Archives preparation visit or something like that. And then I put dot ppt and it gave me a results list that included a PowerPoint presentation called Beginning Your Genealogical Research at the National Archives. And this comes directly from the U.S. National Archives website at archives.gov, which, of course, is a huge website. So this is a really quick way to dig out and pull out this presentation all about getting ready for your trip uh, when you could have been spending hours digging through the website trying to find information on that. So very quickly, by using that .ppt, which is the file extension for PowerPoint presentations, I was able to pull that right out of Google. So I'll have a link directly to the PowerPoint presentation that I found. And when you click it, you'll be prompted to run it like a program. And I found that it just, when you say, you just click run, and it detects PowerPoint there on your computer, if you have PowerPoint loaded, and it just opened the presentation in PowerPoint for me on my computer. But this research technique is really quite a little gem in itself, because sometimes you know exactly what kind of file or document that you're looking for online. And in this case, I was looking for a PowerPoint presentation posted on the internet. So by again, searching for the keywords of the subject, and then adding .ppt, which is the file extension for PowerPoint presentations, Google pulled up only PowerPoint presentations that include my keywords. So You may not be able to get to a genealogy conference very often, but some creative searching may bring up presentations that cover topics that interest you and right there from your home computer. So that's a little gem that you need to add to your search toolbox for sure. And it does work with other file types as well. And finally, when it comes to preparing for really making a trip to an archive or library, any type of repository, I think that my interviews with Marjorie Bell of the Family History Centers are full of great ideas that she gave us for preparing for a research trip, regardless of whether it's the National Archives or the Family History Library. Um, Those interviews, you can find their episodes number 17, 18, and 19. They're part of the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. So quickest way to get there is just go to genealogygems.com and click the yellow icon for that podcast. It's called Family History. And um, you'll find them there. Episodes 17, 18, and 19 should get you ready. So great question, Joan. Have a wonderful time. Happy hunting. 
And of course, like anybody, I enjoy getting nice, encouraging messages from you guys. And Keith in the UK sent me one of those recently through Google+. He writes, I've only just started listening to your podcast, and I think they're brilliant. Ooh, thank you. I like the fact that you cover places outside of the US as well, as it's hard to find a good UK podcast. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Keith. And I've really come to realize that this podcast certainly has a far reach. I mean, literally around the world. And so it's important to me to be inclusive by talking about, you know, a wide range of records and certainly the gems, the strategies, the websites we talk about here on the show. Those can be used by anybody. It doesn't really matter where you're looking. You can still use these tools to get to where you're going. So glad you found the podcast and thank you so much for listening. And thank you for a a nice uplifting message. Very nice to get. And finally, Carol popped into my email box recently to talk about Google Earth for genealogy. Check this out. She says, some time ago, I signed up for your Google Earth webinar through Roots Magic, but on the night of the webinar, I couldn't get in. It's the only Roots Magic webinar that I haven't been able to attend, so I have to think it was due to high volume. We did have a lot of people in that class. (laughs) She says, I put watching the recording on my mental to-do list and unfortunately forgot about it. Meanwhile, my genealogy buddy, Sandy, bought your Google Earth DVDs. She contacted you recently about them, and I watched the first disc with her last week. You should have seen the light bulbs going off above our heads. I then remembered the Roots Magic webinar, and I watched it last night. And you're not going to believe this, but near the end of the webinar, you said that you hope that ideas are just popping in your head. At that exact moment, immediately after you said popping, my nearby water bottle changed shape and popped. I nearly went through the roof. (laughs) Couldn't have timed that any better. Thank you for the excellent webinar and DVDs, and I look forward to viewing disc number two. Ah, I love it. And I'd love to hear, of course, how the podcast impacts your own research. And Bill wrote in recently to share his connection to a recent episode. He says, I love your podcasts. Episode 111, featuring a gem on British home children, touched my heart especially. My mother's father was one of the British home children. During my stay with them in England, mom's cousin said that she thought that my grandfather, Richard Ng, had come to Canada as one of the Bernardo home children, mentioning that she and her husband knew some of the Bernardo family personally. I said that I had never heard of him coming out with the Bernardo homes. Much later, I discovered that she was right about him being one of the British home children. And Bill sent me the record which shows Richard Ng age 14, arriving in 1896 in Halifax. And it lists in the comments section, Dr. Stevenson. Hmm, interesting. Bill says that in the 1891 census, he's aged eight. He's a resident of the children's home in Kent, instead of being with his parents' family in London. He says the family story is that Richard was caught by a bobby selling matches on a street corner at the urging of an older boy. The police officer told him that there was no future for him there and that when he was old enough, he should join the army or go to the colonies. In 1896, he arrived in Canada to begin a new and productive life. I have often wondered whether his older brother James sponsored his coming to Canada as James is referred to in a Bernardo newsletter. The two brothers were very close throughout their lives and their families have remained very close long after the passing of that generation. In 1907, James and Richard sold their oxen to pay the passage so their widowed mother and their sister Ada could join them in the new land. Canada was truly a land of opportunity for all of the members of the Ng family. Amazing story. You can read more from Bill about his Ng family at his genealogy blog at billbuchanan.blogspot.com. Thanks for sharing, Bill. In this gym, we are going to explore the possibility of heading to the lands of our ancestors. I met up with Kathy Worth, the owner of Family Tree Tours at the Midwest Family History Expo recently, and picked her brain 
about how to go about putting together such a trip. Kathy feels strongly that no family tree research is complete until you experience the place your ancestors came from. Her company, Family Tree Tours, provides research assistance to genealogy enthusiasts and ancestry trips to German-speaking countries. Whether a group heritage tour, private genealogy tour, or independent heritage trip, Kathy and her on-the-ground German expert, Matthias Uthoff, provide her clients the opportunity to learn more about their family roots, to connect with family, and to learn about their ancestors before they immigrated. Here's my conversation with Kathy Worth. I'm here at the Family History Expo in Overland Park, Kansas. This is the Midwest Expo, my first time here. And um, somebody that I've been talking to on email lives not too far away, about three hours away, and that is Kathy Worth of Family Tree Tours. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Lisa. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too, because we've talked on email, and you said, hey, are you coming out? I'm like, yeah. So (laughs) we're right down the hall from each other, Mm -hmm. and really fun to talk to you about travel, because we're all watching these, um, you know, uh, who do you think you are? And you see these people going on these grand, you know, trips to discover their roots. But that's kind of what you've been doing for quite a while, isn't it? Yes, it is. And not too terribly long ago, I don't know if it was a replay or not, I listened to one of your shows where you had talked about being in England and going mm-hmm. to your hometown. And just some of the um, emotions that you expressed really rang true with me because that's how when I first started, how... You know, I had gone to my hometown, and it was just such an emotional experience. And so was, that was many years ago. But since then, I've uh, a few years ago started a company that take, helps people have that same kind of a, a trip. And I think we've all thought about it, haven't we? I mean, at some point, even if it's, you know, in the U.S., but for particularly those who want to go overseas, um, there is something very emotional that happens. We're getting so much further, so much faster in our research because of what's coming online. So I think in a way it frees us to maybe go do the footwork too Mm -hmm. and go see it in in real person. Let's let's go back to the beginning and talk about um, how did you first get started thinking about doing this with other people? Did you go and put your own tour together for yourself? Well, like I said, many years ago, I started helping my mom do genealogy when I was a teenager, and we had, you know, by accident got an address, and we went and, you know, had that experience, you know, that was 25 years ago, I guess. I went and, you know, it was just, you know, really emotional. So was, all these years, I've kind of known that. And a few years back, I went on a trip with some girlfriends to Switzerland, and uh, the gal that was leading the tour um, was a European tour guide, and she takes small groups. And I kind of started talking to her about we. One of my friends, her hometown was in Switzerland, and I said, "Well, Mary, we have to oh, we have well, to go there, yeah. you know, even though she's not that big of a genealogist." So after the trip, the four of us went and we visited this little hometown, and you know, knocked on doors because trying to find somebody that spoke English and where's the church, and you know, just all the dumb things. Where's the old cemetery? Well, there isn't any old cemeteries <laughs> in Switzerland. So it got me to thinking. Well, you know, people. Really Really need to know a few things before they just start stumbling around over there like we did. So um, I talked to my friend, and you know, she gave me some hints on how to put tours together and stuff. And I was very lucky that uh, the genealogy society I belong to, we kind of have a sister city relationship with a uh, society in Germany. And so I, you know, was contact, did some contact for them, did some research for them over here, and told them that I would like to bring a group. So. I met some people who helped me, and now one of them is my partner who helps me in Germany. So that's kind of how we got started. And so he's the person that helps me find the hometown contacts for people. Wonderful. So let's start, though. Somebody's listening, let's say, and they're going, oh, Germany, she just said my word. And I'm thinking about, I've always wanted to go. I know me, I've got German ancestors would love to go over there. I've got a couple of place names, got some information about where they immigrated from. How do you start when someone calls you up and says, Kathy, can you help me? What do I have to do to, how can I figure this out? And do you take me or can you just help me figure out what to do when I get there? We can do both. <laughs> we um, 
We um, have a couple of group tours to Germany a year usually, and what we do is we pick an area of Germany that uh, maybe it be Baden or something like that, and we pick one home base town that's kind of in the center of places, and then we travel out on public transportation, the train system usually by day. And we do things as a group, and it's all kind of geared to people that are interested in family research. We have meet with researchers from a local society as soon as we get there, hopefully, so that if you have further research you want done, you know, you've got some contacts there. I try to get lectures by historians and people to tell you about the history of the area so that you know why your people left and, you know, what was going on at their, at that time frame. Um, and then we do some fun things, but then there's free days in there where that's when the people on our tours go out to their hometowns. If it's within a two-hour train ride, my contact, my partner in Germany, sets it up so that somebody in the town meets you, make sure the church is open, make sure the museum is open, you know, maybe have done some more research for you, and then shows you around the town. And, you know, hopefully there's sometimes relatives there. You get to meet cousins and things like that. Now, if you want to go on your own, we do the same thing for you. We can help you, you know, set up your own accommodations. And um, he makes the contacts in the towns for you. So you can do it independently if you want, go on your own, or you can go with us. I would imagine it's that contact piece that is really <laughs> valuable. I mean, mm -hmm. because like you say, you can show up and, and you don't realize, oh, this is the national holiday yeah, and nothing's true. open. <laughs> what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. um, so the gentleman, your partner that helps you, he, you just give him information about here's the places and the families and, and he can kind of help gear, maybe direct you to the kinds of things. Do you kind of help coach people as to what to look for? Because sometimes we don't know what we don't know. We that's don't know what might enrich mm -hmm. the experience. But that's true. And what we do is I, I send you a research questionnaire where you have to fill out the immigrant person, everything that you know about him, and you know sibling names or parents' names and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I send to Germany. That that's what he uses to contact the towns. And yes, we try to explain to you that you know in Germany especially there's living history museums for each area for each state, so that you can go there and see what kind of farms and houses and things that there were, uh, if there's any other, um, you know, cultural things that we think would be neat for you to see for your your history, we tell you that. But the most important thing, like you said, is the contact there, because you can show up and these, the little museums in each town are sometimes only open one day a week, mm -hmm. and um, are the archives, you have to have an appointment, and, oh, okay. you know, they're, sometimes they're only open for limited hours, and we need to, um, we need contacts for like somebody that, that will meet you and show you around so mm -hmm. that's who he, he he finds for you that sounds like it'd be really fun to have somebody that you can meet up with and they go okay this yeah. is my town and let me that's show right. you this is usually a local yeah. historian or somebody that does know the town and um, sometimes they're professional researchers and in that case you know if it's, if it's somebody that has to you know that does it as a living then that has to get paid but for the most part it's people that you know are just excited about somebody coming to visit their town and uh, okay. they do it for nothing you know so sometimes um, they are really uh, educated about their town and so you know the whole history of it too and they find sometimes look for relatives for you. Oh, wouldn't that be fun and have that who do you think you are moment yeah. where you're <laughs> knocking on the door yeah. and mm -hmm. um, now it sounds like then we, we need to kind of plan ahead a little bit. What kind of a time frame do you suggest to your clients? Um, and that's very important because um, we have two trips coming up in September and um, Baden is a very popular area so we've got a little bit larger group than we normally take, 20 people. And um, with the combination of the two, he's got 50 towns that he's looking for. So that's a lot of work, and that's a lot of time. And it does sometimes take time to make these contacts. So um, I'm tell, I tell people, um, you know, at least give us six months or so so that we can make the contacts because now people are on vacation there. Mm -hmm. He's having running into some problems with having to wait till people get back from vacation off, you know, a lot of so times. yeah you know and then I'll have people call me sometimes too and say I'm going to Germany in a month and they barely know the town where they you know it's like well I don't think we can do that <laughs> you know it takes a little bit of research so in terms of the groups um, just to make sure that I understand it clearly are you talking about that 
Perhaps you set a date um, a couple times a year and you say, okay, we're going to hit the bottom area if you have an interest. So that's kind of your central point. And then each of the participants can have their own right. agenda. Okay. Is that right? Their own right. itinerary. You know, because some of the other, um, that makes us just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Some other tour companies, you know, you go as a group to one place, you know, or maybe they'll do a family group that's all going to the same town. We are able to get you to different towns and stuff. So it is made up of people that are going to different towns usually. But, yes, I post, you know, we post our trips, you know, try to be at least a year in advance, but not always. <laughs> but, you know, which areas that we're going to. And then people, if they know their hometowns, they, they'll know, well, my my town is in that area and stuff. So then they'll contact me. And that's what that's what we do is, like, we do things as a group, and then we have free days where you go out, everybody goes out to their hometowns. Like in Baden, I have a lady that's going down to Switzerland, so it's not too terribly far away, and, and he's made contacts for her down there, too. And Alsace, we're going over into Alsace this time, too. So, you know, we can get pretty far, pretty far around. Yeah. That must be a lot of fun for you. It sounds like it's it's been a personal interest and passion, and here it is uh, as yeah. your own business. Yeah. Well, and uh, as I say, I, I also tell people, um, as you can say, because you can see me, <laughs> I'm middle-aged, and it's just, it really is a dream come true because, I mean, it's, a, it's it really is a lot of work. It's, it, it is fun, but it's a lot of work keeping all this, uh, you know, because we have to figure out all the train schedules for people yeah. and all the logistics and how they're going to get there and get back and um, but it is fun, and I, I, we're always, uh, because when everybody goes out to their towns, we don't necessarily go with everyone. So we're kind of like parents waiting for kids <laughs> to get home and find out how their day was, you know, and uh, make sure they get back for one thing. But uh, it's uh, exciting for us to find out when they've had a good, uh, like I said, it's like Christmas time. <laughs> everybody comes back all excited and, oh, you should have seen what they, we saw and did. So it's, it's really fun. So I imagine you've gotten really a lot of expertise about Germany. Now, do you branch out beyond Germany? Well, we, as I say, the, the interest has been mostly Germany. So, and my partner is Germany, but we're we have um, done Ireland. We're and we're going to do. We did a research trip to Ireland, and I've had a lot of people interested in Poland. So, we're starting to work on that. I've made some contacts with some research people over there, but it's just figuring out the logistics on that. So, we're we're working on that maybe for next year, hopefully. See, that seems interesting, interesting to me because I, while my ancestors were German, they lived in what is now Poland because it was East Prussia. Yeah, that's kind of how that started is I have a group that wants to go to Mecklenburg, Pomerania, right. and all of a sudden a lot of the towns You're are in Poland. All in Poland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why we're working on that. Yeah. So, And I've had a lot of interest in Poland. So for the first-time traveler, the, the person who does this, what are some of your recommendations? Let's say they, they get over there. Um, do you ever find people with uh, unreasonable expectations? Or do you find things that tend to snag people that if they just knew ahead of time that they would have a more pleasurable trip? Well, I my famous line I tell everybody is embrace the culture. Yes. <laughs> You're not at home anymore and things are a little bit different, although surprisingly, especially in Germany, if you have German heritage, you're going to find a lot of things that we do. We just call them something different, right. but it's that there. Okay. Um, and just to be flexible and um, be prepared, you know, really be prepared ahead of time. Like I said, I, I have people that I want to warn people about getting information off of the internet and, and you know, thinking that that's, um, if it's not sourced, I've, I've got a couple people on that are going on the trip now with me that they're, we've contacted the town and they can't find anything there because and their information was from online. So you really need to, to source that. And that's why the other thing is give us enough time to figure that out because, you know, now we've only got, you know, a month and a half. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do, but um, yeah, be prepared and, and just embrace the culture and know that um, you know if you're prepared to visit there, then you should be able to have a successful trip. Well, it sounds like you help them do a lot of the preparation, which is in the, the gray area that we're not too sure about. You guys have real insight. How long are some of these trips? How much time do you really think someone needs to budget to get the most out of a trip? Well, our trips are usually about 10 days, or we do 12 days at some time. And Americans... Um, usually don't like to take longer than two weeks, you know, unless they've got a lot of time. So, um, but if you, and I also have people that, you know, have a hometown way up north and then way down south and they think they're going to, and I understand that you're maybe only going once, so you want to. Um, but it takes about, I'm going to say at least six or seven hours to get you know, from north to south, maybe on the train and or driving, maybe a little bit longer, in four or five hours east to west. So just, you know, you got to be 
you know, mindful that you're, you know, it's not just a hop, skip, and a jump, even though it looks smaller than the United States. So I think um, at least um, two weeks or seven to uh, ten days uh, or two weeks, if you, depending on how far you go. We have people that go on our trips that, you know, have a hometown in that area, and then they'll go on another week on their own. So we also help them for that second half when they go on their own. So two to three weeks, some people do if they've got different areas. But I think 10 days is probably the best. Well, my final question would be, if you make a trip like this and you make some connections, maybe you can get lucky and meet some cousins, do you find that some people then want to go back and do the repeat because they're not starting to make their own connections? Or do you find it's like on to the next country? Oh, no. I have, um, I've i got a couple that's going with me for their third time this time. Wow. And um, they've made um, had luck that they've gotten cousins in two of the different places that they've gone to. And they've been in touch with them. And over the, you know, so they've kind of got a relationship going with them now. But, you know, um, some people like go on to the next country, but some people like to establish and go back and see it again. Mm-hmm. Really build a whole new family yeah. relationship there, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, Kathy, tell us where we can find you and your company online. It's called Family Tree Tours at www.familytreetours.com. Perfect. And you are Kathy Worth, and I really appreciate you taking some time out because it kind of gets you excited thinking about, you know, I need to think ahead, right? Six to 12 months, but the idea of making that trip, I know the one that we did to England was just wonderful. It's funny, do you find sometimes, you know, you can plan so many great things and other things you couldn't have planned in a million years, but you have to be flexible to let it happen, don't you think? Yes, and that's that's part of the thing. We, like I said, we travel on our trips by public transportation. So sometimes we'll have groups and we'll be talking speaking English on the train and somebody will hear us and then say oh well did you do this or did you try this and it gives us something new that we wouldn't didn't even know to do or Got you know open to. right and so <laughs> it is it's, it's really fun well fun to meet you in person thanks so much for joining us on the podcast thank you nice to meet you too Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 115. Of course, got all the information for you that we've talked about here on the show today. You can head to the show notes to find that. Just go to genealogygems.com, click podcast in the menu, navigate the links, click in the links all the way through to episode 115, and you'll find all the information there in the show notes. And I want to thank my special guest, Kathy Worth from Family Tree Tours. How exciting would that be to make the trip to your ancestral homeland? Um, Kathy sure knows her stuff and gave us a lot of great ideas for doing that. Would love to hear if you end up making a trip yourself to the old country (laughs) and uh, how your experiences were and who you met. Um, We sat and chatted and she told me some amazing stories of people that had connected up with long lost cousins they had never known. So fascinating stuff. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can email me genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or leave a voicemail on the voicemail line. You may end up on the show. It's 925-272-4021. Also want to give you a heads up that the newest premium podcast episode is out. That's episode number 73. And that one is a lot of fun because I In doing research for it, I ended up finding several really interesting kind of historic photograph websites. And um, some of these are ideas that you can use. Some of them are just simply inspirational and motivational. I think that you'll really enjoy it. And if you are interested in doing a very interesting 3D effect on old photographs in your family history collection, this is pretty cool. I have a free download software program for you that you can use if you want to try your hand at it. And that is all part of Genealogy Gems premium podcast episode number 73. That episode also includes a video showing you some of those photographic websites. And I also have another free website for you that does some conversion of documents for you, taking images off the web and actually converting them to PDF documents so that you can include them in some of your family history projects. So again, that's premium episode number 73. 
We'd love to have you join us as a Genealogy Gems Premium member. You can do that by simply going to genealogygems.com and clicking the Join Today button. It's the bright blue button in the upper right-hand corner. Just takes a couple of seconds to sign up and then you will have instant access to all of the premium podcast episodes, the video series and tutorials, and lots more for a whole year. Um, so that's Genealogy Gems Premium. And of course, to keep up with everything that's going on here at Genealogy Gems and, and all the new gems that we're finding, um, sign up while you're at our website for the Genealogy Gems free e-newsletter. Um, comes out whenever there's new episodes, and we always include additional articles and extra gems, things that'll just keep you moving, keep you progressing in your family history research. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.